All right, Revelation Wellness community, we have a new friend this week, and not only a new friend, but a, a rare occurrence over here sometimes in Revelation Wellness. We have a guy. We have Chris Martin with us sharing the message of his new book. I love it. I actually got two copies. I don't know if Moody made a mistake, but I, I'm like, or oh, is the Lord trying to talk to me? The book is titled Terms of Service, The Real Cost of Social Media. I'm going to show it for those of you on YouTube. There it is. Terms of Service, The Real Cost of Social Media. So here's what I know. Uh, everyone, everyone in Revelation Wellness community, you know, we, we do the hard stuff here. We don't just tell you everything you want to hear. There's some, some things we need to hear. And so brace for impact <laughs> in terms of some of this might feel a little convicting and that's a good thing. We need this. We need to keep this message alive. So Chris, thank you for coming and welcome to the Revelation Wellness Podcast. Of course. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me and I'm glad to be here. And I hope our, our, hope our conversation isn't too heavy, though Though I, <laughs> your warning is is uh, fair. It's good. You're right? yeah. It is. No, I, I think we I think we're all pretty well aware of the things we like about social media, you know. Yeah. So why would I why would I write a book about that? I, I do think though that we right. uh, that we need to be a little bit more conscious of just the ways that maybe it affects us that that could be more negative. Totally awareness. That is that is a key word to live a whole an integrated life. I've got to be aware of all the things that might be having an effect that I'm not aware of. So thank God for the Holy Spirit that does convict us and does illuminate these things. Chris, before we jump into the book, I just want to know a little bit about you. I'm sure our audience would like to know where you at, married kids, single, and kind of how you got to where you are uh, right now with this message. So I'm originally from Northeast Indiana, from Fort Wayne is where I am from. I went to Taylor University for my undergrad. Right. Um, and in 2013, my wife Susie and I moved down here right after we got married to the Nashville area. So we live just outside Nashville, Tennessee, um, where actually as of today, we're bracing for some severe weather, which is pretty normal uh, this time of year. And uh, it starts to get a little warmer and it's like, oh, this is nice. Here come the storms. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, we live down here just outside Nashville. Um, and my wife, Susie, like I said, and I have, uh, we have a dog, his name is Rizzo, and we have a daughter, her name is Maggie, and uh, she's just almost two, so Goodness. she'll be two, she'll be two wow. in April, and uh, yeah, so it's been fun, it's been so fun to be a parent, and obviously very difficult, um, yeah. and, and we've, she was born, you know, April 6th of 2020, so, uh, wow. you know, it's this weird period of learning wow. how to parent amid yeah. a pandemic. It's been odd, um, yeah. and so, so I spent seven years working at Lifeway Christian Resources, one of the largest Christian resource Bible study providers in the world, yeah. and that's what, that's what brought me to Nashville, because they're headquartered here, okay. and then uh, in September of 2020, I moved to Moody Publishers, based out of Chicago, but still yeah. live here in the Nashville area, yeah. and uh, I had spent most of my time at Lifeway working in social media, and uh, after a long period of time doing that, and particularly a tumultuous time through the 2016 election and then COVID, and then we, we shut down all of our bookstores, I was running yeah. social media during all of that. And so toward the end, I was like, you know, I think I want to not do social media so much anymore. I think I'd like to do something a little bit more offline. And yeah. so, uh, so I'm, I'm glad that I get to keep one foot in the social space in my new work at Moody and, and one foot in the offline space. I get to edit books. So it was around, it was around 2017. 20, maybe early 2018, when I first read the book, Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil yeah. Postman, yeah, written in 1985. And it could not be more relevant today. Uh, and, and I was so taken by, I'd read some of Postman before in college, okay. but I'd never read Amusing Ourselves to Death. And it's really about exactly what the title says, how in 1985, specifically with the onset and popularity of the television, Postman was concerned that we were we were amusing ourselves to death and um, that we were losing our ability to discern fact from fiction. And we were just interested in being entertained and how, how TV was playing a role in that, mm. man, if you, if you pick TV. up that book on it, pick, yeah, pick up that book on Amazon today for probably 10, 12 bucks and read it. And there are just so many modern applications to social media. Uh, wow. He has a significant, he has a significant part in there on the telegraph, which is a technology that I never interacted with. Certainly and uh, it's like it's like you could substitute the word Twitter uh, for with the word telegraph throughout that entire Same. chapter. And it's like, uh, it's pretty much Same exactly thing. what's going on. Yeah. Um, and so so anyway, it's it's a great it's a great book. And so I read that book and I was like, man, you know, I was working in social media and I was doing a lot of strategy in social media and like, how do we use it for good? How do we use it to reach as many people as possible? Yeah. But when I read that book, I was like, man, I really 
I haven't really thought much about what this is doing to us, like on a deep level. Mm, um, mm. And it was around then after reading that book, I was like, it would be, I think it would be really helpful if there was somebody who wrote like Neil Postman, he died in 2003. So he, we never really got a ton of his thought on our kind of modern yeah, age. Right. And I was like, it, it'd be great if we could hear from Dr. Postman today and also from a sort of Christian perspective, because he wasn't a Christian. He was very friendly to Christians and faith groups in general, but he was kind of a, kind of an agnostic Jew kind yeah. of guy. And, and so, yeah. so he, he, he was, he was really friendly with faith communities, but he wasn't, he wasn't coming from a Christian perspective. And so I was like, man, I, I would love to read a Christian Neil Postman writing in the 21st century. And I was having trouble finding one. I've since found a group of people who do write in that vein, but I was like, well, I'll, maybe I'll try to do it because this stuff is really interesting to me. And I've yeah. been working in social media for a long time. And so I started writing, kind of doing my best Neil Postman in the 21st century from a Christian perspective impression. And that led to a newsletter, which got us pretty significant following. And then uh, I proposed the book and, and here we are. So that's so incredible. Wow. Sounds a little bit like my journey of I've, I've, you know, fitness, I really like fitness, but I haven't seen anything from a, a biblical approach, a holistic approach of it. And so it sometimes can feel like a, you're, you know, maybe yelling at like John the Baptist out in the desert. Like anyone getting this? Is anyone? Is everyone's running to their phones and doing all the things? So I, I feel your burden. And yet I also know the delight that comes with just knowing you're being obedient to the call. So social media, let's talk about the book. Like, so why your book, why this book, who should read this book? I probably a better question. Yeah. Um, I wrote the book really for anyone. So I, I just finished a manuscript for a second book that's specifically for like ministry leaders. Wow. The second okay. book that I'm working on is, is like social media is changing the people you lead and here's how you should lead them amid that. That's this fantastic. One, yeah. Yeah. Th this one in terms of service is really like social media is changing us and here's okay. what we can do about it. So, okay. so it's really, um, I wrote, in fact, I wrote it. Um, you know, there are a lot of really great Christian writers in this space, but what their books tend to be is more kind of like a theology of social media, if you will, like a, like very loaded with scripture and, and, and Christian thought, which that's helpful. But I wanted to write a book that was more could be read by a non-Christian and they could, they wouldn't feel like they were being preached to. Yeah. Um, but I also wasn't going to leave my Christian worldview out of it either. Yeah. So yeah. there's limited scripture quoted throughout. And most of it is toward the end, which is dedicated to like applicate, like, here's what we do now. Um, okay. And that, that, that tends to be more Christian oriented, but like mm -hmm. I wrote it with neighbors and friends in mind uh, who I know aren't believers. Mm -hmm. And if I just came out swinging with like, here's what Jesus says about what you should do about social yeah. media, I would have lost them. Yeah. And so I really, it was kind of a missional project in that way. And that I wanted to write it to where my Christian worldview is clear. Like it's clear that I'm a believer and, and I cite some scripture here and there, yeah. but it's not like a, here's what Christians should do about social media. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's more of a, Hey, social media is affecting all of us in these ways, whether you're a Christian or not. And then some of my solutions or just suggestions on how to have a more healthy relationship, obviously swing toward a more Christian worldview. And so I would encourage like, man, if you do a neighborhood book club, like that's how I really like that kind of vibe where you have a trusted group of people where maybe you don't all share the same faith systems, but you're also um, not antagonistic to one another. Like that's, I really love it for anyone who uses social media and wonders, you know, I, I've really found myself getting more angry when I use these things. Is that, is that normal? Is that what? why is that happening to me? Or I, I find myself falling for fake news all the time. Like, why does that, why is that happening? That's good. Um, and is that, is that good or bad or so? So it's really uh, for anyone, uh, which generally isn't like a good book strategy, but, but I was like, I think anybody could benefit from this. That's so. right. You said on page 41 books talking about social media and, and what I think we all from is Facebook that Facebook knows that the most reliable way to keep you scrolling is to make you mad. Divisive content leads to more engagement than unifying content. So that's a great position. Tell me more about the divisive content that we should be aware of as Christians. Yeah, um, that, that actually is not just like my commentary. In 2018, Facebook did a research study and internal, they have like an internal research team that regularly researches how their platform works and how it's used. And that internal research team at Facebook came up with results that showed, Hey, people stay on our platform longer 
when they're mad. Um, and when they did that study in 2018, they figured that out and shelved the research, didn't tell anybody about it, and actually increased the factors and the algorithm that make that happen in order to keep people on the platform longer. It wasn't until 2020, the Wall Street Journal did a story where that data was kind of leaked outside of the organization. And so, um, so yeah, like I, I have a lot of skepticism toward Facebook for things like that, when they, they have data like that, that could really help users and, and don't share it. Um, but I think we should be aware that these algorithms and these organizations, these companies do not exist for our good. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that they exist for our demise either. They're not like, in here. I don't think they're like these devilish, fiendish people who are like Bond villains or something wow. like that. Maniacal, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. They exist to make money, which there's nothing wrong with that. Like I'm right. not like in, in, right. a, in a capitalist society like America, that's totally fine. But the, the problem is the way they, that many of them, Facebook primary among them, the way they make the most money is by keeping people on the platform for as long as possible so that they can sell more ads at a higher rate. And yeah. the way they keep people on the platform is when people come across content that makes them mad. Um, it's not people, when people come mm-hmm. across content that makes them happy, uh, they're more likely to kind of shut their phone off and go about doing what they're doing. But when they, when they get mad, they sit there and they argue in the comments section or they share like, I can't, can you believe they did this or that? Um, mm-hmm. And so ang- anger, I mean, this like fear sells, right? People talk about how like sex sells. Well, fear sells too. Yeah. And, yeah. and so yes. like, you, if you ever hear political campaigns are often like fear oriented, like you don't want these people to do that, do you? Yeah. And it's this, the same yeah. kind of goes for Facebook. Like fear drives us to action. And action keeps people on the platform. And that's how these companies make more money. And so we just need to know, like a lot of the book I write about, and it, just in my writing and speaking in general, I talk about the difference between social internet and social media. Um, okay. And Postman actually, in his, yeah. in his work, talks about the difference between technology and a medium. Um, and these are different. So social media, that's medium, right? Yeah. Social internet is like the technology. The technology is like the TV or the internet. It's like the actual like ones and zeros, the code, the math, all of that. And and so it's the it's the actual like uh, piece of architecture, if you will, um, okay. the foundation. Media or medium is the culture we create using a particular technology. So wow. if you look at the TV is the easiest example. The television you have in your house, that's a piece of technology. But the TV show, the sitcom, the reality show, whatever, those are media that is, that's culture that's being created using the television. On the internet, we talk about social media all the time. And if I say social media, you think of Facebook, you think of TikTok, you think of the videos, you know, that's the media. But I think while that's all worth our attention, like, should I be watching this? Should I be not watching this? That's, that's worth, those are worthy questions. But I think a lot of us ignore the fact that the technology that undergirds all of this stuff, the math, like the algorithm we just Mm. talked about that like delivers you content that it knows that you're not going to like that stuff has, that stuff has a greater effect on us than we realize the technology is bent against human flourishing. And it's, so it's not just the media, it's not just the media that lives on top. It's the whole foundation is kind of broken. And I think it affects us in more negative ways than we realize. I was thinking in my head for this, it just seems the enemies, kind of the, the, the thing that happens over and over is when good things get twisted for a personal gain thing or a personal God thing. Same thing with the food industry. Food isn't bad, but then what we've done to change foods that people will want food more of it, the food that's not good for them changes the cravings of the brain. Have you read the book Dopamine Nation? No, but it's on my list because it's been read it multiple times. Yes. Like instantly when you started talking about like, oh, he will love Dopamine Nation, Anna Lemke. It's one of the, I, I it was my favorite book of 2021 or what are we in? 2022. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what year is it? Yeah. That, that whole setup of we keep doing the thing we don't want and we under, wonder, wonder why. So I want to drop the pin, Chris, on what would be some health ramifications. How would somebody know I need to take a break or something? It's gone too far. Social media, I'm not using it. It's using me. Man. Um, so I'm not a health expert, nor am I a psychologist. And I always like to preface any answer like this with that. So 
um, find maybe find people who are those things that can professionally help you address this stuff. But um, I think exactly what you just described. If you find that you're using these platforms and they make you miserable, <laughs> but but you can't stop, but you can't stop. Um, there's probably the best sign that maybe you should take some time to step away. Now, let me be clear. If you've been listening so far, you may think I'm like anti-social media. I'm not. I maintain a robust social media presence. Um, I like, I never, I never encourage people to delete their accounts or log off as a, as a solution to the problems we're describing. Now, I do think that can be very healthy. Let me be clear, especially like if you find that you're, you're using it and it's making you miserable. But if we have this idea that, oh, if I just delete my accounts, I can extricate social media from my life. We're dead wrong. Yeah. I talk to my 88-year-old grandmother every Sunday when I'm making dinner, and I'll call her up, and she's never used the internet in her life. She's 88, (laughs) never used the internet. No way. Yeah, but two to three times a month out of the four or five times I call her, she will tell me about something her friend saw on Facebook and told her about. And sometimes she's even been duped by like fake news from oh. Facebook and she'll get mad at, she'll be like, can you believe that such and so, and uh, how do I write Facebook? Like she wants to write a letter to Facebook. Um, and like, grandma, grandma, I don't think you, I don't, I don't think you can do that. Um, but, but like, so that, so all of that is to say, yeah. like, she's never had an account, let alone had one to delete. And she's still impacted by this stuff. Yeah. So I, I delete your accounts or, or, or log off and give, give your password to somebody else for an extended period of time if you need a break. But if you find, if you think that you're going to totally get it out of your life by, by shutting yeah. things down, you're wrong. And so I think it's a matter of learning to live with it in a healthy way yeah. rather than trying to somehow divorce ourselves from it entirely. So I think that the primary way is the primary sign would be if it's making you feel bad in one way or another, sad, angry, stressed, yeah. tense, um, then, then give your password to somebody else, get off for a period of time. Um, but I would say at some point, you're probably going to have to figure out how to have a healthy relationship with it because having mm-hmm. zero, mm-hmm. having zero relationship with it is near impossible. That's good. What are your personal practices, Chris? Um, so I, I have social media open a good bit during the day because of the nature of my work. Um, I, like I said, I do a little bit of work on social media, um, Mm -hmm. while I, during, in my day job, I don't manage it primarily all day, every day, like I used to, um, gratefully. Mm -hmm. Um, but I like, there are, there are like, uh, even right now we're sitting here and I have my tweet deck open, which is a a platform that I use to have, I have six different columns of. Uh, tech and social media people I like to follow and sports people I like to follow and and funny people and finance and news, Nashville specific stuff. And so I like to look at that stuff to keep it track. Like I I always like to be informed. And so I like that, but like, I don't follow people who make me mad. Like during the, during the 2016 election, before the 2016 election, for instance, I used to follow tons of news organizations and like Mm -hmm. political thinkers on both sides of the aisle, because that stuff is interesting to me, even Mm -hmm. if I sometimes find myself to be a bit politically homeless or whatever. Um, But like after that whole season, I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like I'm just getting frustrated. And so like I unfollowed every news organization, every political person. And I just follow stuff that makes me happy now. Like I follow people that make me laugh or are writing insightful things about social media. Um, I, I don't, I don't feel compelled to follow things that somehow make me mad. Um, If people I'm friends with on Facebook are posting things that make me frustrated, I just mute them. I don't block them and kick them out of my life, but I I unfollow their content and I don't pay attention anymore. The other thing, and this is really helpful for me, and it might be helpful for some listeners, is I have an iPhone and I I use the the screen time function on my iPhone. So if you have an iPhone, I'm I'm sure there's one for Android as well. Mm -hmm. But if you have an iPhone, you can go in and set how many hours you're allowed to use social media every day. And you can set when certain apps shut down for a period of time. So I can't use any apps outside of like my Bible app or my Kindle app or, or like other basic functional apps from uh, from nine o'clock at night till seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So I'm not right. allowed to be in email. I'm not allowed to be in social media from nine o'clock at night till seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And I, ha- I don't have this on currently because I, cur- I think I have a pretty 
good relationship with social right now. But in the past, when I've felt that I've been on it too much, I will turn on a no more than an hour or an hour and a half or something of social media every day yeah. so that I, I don't use something more than I, more than I need to be. So you can set that, you can set it so that you do have the password and it just kind of gives you an obstacle to using it more kind of checks right. your conscience there. Right. Or if you find that, if you find that you just keep overriding it all the time, give a password to a friend or a spouse so that you, you can't get into those apps unless you have to go to them and ask them to give you the password so that you can get to whatever app you're trying to use that kind of stuff. I mean, we need, some of us can, and I have, it's happened to me can get so helplessly chained to these platforms yeah. that we, we need to lock the door after a certain period of time yeah. and give the, give the key to somebody else. A, a lot of times, like if, if we want to get serious about this stuff and you're not doing that, you should probably ask if you're serious about corralling this stuff. Cause I think that is one of the easiest ways to just start to corral it a little bit. How can the gospel help us with our connection to the social media world? I think as believers, as followers of Christ, we should be trying to glorify God in all things. Mm. And I'm a big fan of Eugene Peterson's book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, mm -hmm. which I just read for the first time in 2020. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was familiar with it, had heard probably half the book in quotes from it, but had never <laughs> read it cover to cover like for myself. And um, the Christian life is really, I just love that idea, which he gets, I think, from Nietzsche, that the, it's the Christian life is a long obedience in the same direction. Um, and it's not perfect. You're going to stumble, you're going to fall, you're going to trip over yourself or in potholes or whatever else. And I think as we use social media, if we find that our, um, if we, if we find that our witness, our ability to follow Christ faithfully is being hindered by our relationship with social media, we should start to ask to what extent should I be allowing this to have a presence in my life? That's where, mm -hmm. that's where um, giving your passwords to friends or, or a spouse or something like that and, and keeping yourself out of it um, may be a good idea. And so I think, I think we should be looking to glorify God in all things. And if social media is hindering our ability to do that, um, we, we should, we should really evaluate our relationship with it. And so, and, and the God, but the gospel also, I mean, there's, there's grace, by the grace of God, there is grace in the gospel. And so I think when we find ourselves acting foolish on social media, which I have plenty of times, when we find ourselves being foolish, I think we need to not condemn ourselves either. Um, and, and recognize that, that the grace of God in Christ uh, covers our social media sins too, whether actual sins or rather, or, or whether uh, just like faux pas, right. Or like, yeah. you know, we're just being goofy and, and not, yeah. Um, and, and not taking it seriously. So I, I think we should just recognize there's grace, but also that, that what we do online is real. I've actually mm -hmm. run into a shocking number of people in the last year or two who either themselves or they have relationships with people who genuinely think that what they do online like isn't real life, that they shouldn't right. be held accountable for it, that they shouldn't, um, that like really that like God doesn't care, that it's just some sort of form of existence totally divorced from who they are offline. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think we should take social media really seriously and recognize it's as real as our offline lives are. It makes me think of when we talk about the gospel and in a world that we now have with our social media and this digital platform access to people and their opinions, you have a whole chapter titled, um, we pursue affirmation instead of truth. And isn't that true? Like social media, we can find what we want that affirms our views and then it compounds over and over. And that's what we believe. And, and I, I read a statistic that we touch our phones 2,617 times. And on, that's one of the average 2,617 times I'm reaching for my phone. doesn't mean I'm on social media 2,617 times, but knowing if you know social media is where you're finding your information or your community. That's another concern that I co. There are people who know that, yeah, it's not good for me. And if, but if they were to pull away, they don't have any connection. They're lacking community. So then they get back in there again. And it's like, bang, bang, round and round. So what do you do about that? What is your thoughts with about the community aspect? Um. One of the greatest concerns that I have is that the it used to be that online life was secondary to offline life. 
so that that what happened on the internet was downstream from what happened off of the internet. So there, there was a time, believe it or not, where we really only connected with people on the internet who we knew personally. The early days of social media, most of us weren't connecting with strangers. So crazy, we were, yeah. Yeah, we were connecting with people we knew personally. And, and I think today it's a lot more normal to try to forge relationships online and, and uh, forsake re- real life, quote unquote, offline relationships. And, and, and like online relationships have come to supplant offline. And I think yeah. my hope is, it's funny, like I used to have a really hard time to get people to care about how the internet was shaping us in some negative ways. But one of the, I suppose, positive side effects of this whole coronavirus pandemic and our over, what I would say our over-reliance on social media as a means of community is I have found that a lot of people have relied on it so much in the last couple of years yeah. that they've started to see that it's, it ends up ringing a bit shallow in comparison with yeah. offline relationships. Now, yeah. my, my concern, and I hope we don't go this route, my concern is that our appetite for embodied relationships starts to wane and we start to want online relationships more than offline. One of my thoughts on this is the reason we cling to online community rather than offline is we desperately want others affection and we want to feel loved but we're really deeply afraid of being known yeah and having Preach. internet yeah. having internet community having social media community really gives us pretty easily that feeling of affirmation and affection and love mm. without the risk and the vulnerability that comes with actually letting people into the mess of our lives come on uh and so I think that's why it's really attractive. And I think my hope is somehow, whether through the local church, whether through conviction by the Holy Spirit, that we can start to see again that the vulnerability that comes with true intimacy can deliver a level of affection and and love that internet relationships simply can't deliver. But but I think we've, it's like, I mean, truly social media relationships can become sort of like emotional candy. I mean, this is a yes. this is a, a wellness community, a fitness community. Like, yes. I, I, you guys understand this analogy. It can really become like emotional candy, where it's just like there's no nutritional value. Come on, but it's but it might taste really good. Yeah. Whereas whereas offline, uh, it's like eating your vegetables. A lot of times, you may not want to go to coffee with that friend. You may not want to go to community group, but it really ends up being better for you in the long run. Um, and so I think I don't know. I, I think that's kind of my thought on it. I, not not saying like I have friends who live across the country primarily we communicate through social through some form yeah. of social media but but a lot of them like i first met offline or or it's like kind of become a way to maintain those online relationships where i start to get concerned is if our relationships that are primarily online end up overtaking in terms of time and attention the relationships that we were trying to maintain offline and that whole the risk of being known that is that's just it makes me think of when Jesus says broad is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow, hard, and few is the one that leads to life. And for us to have real life, we have to be in real living community, which then means it's going to be hard at times because we're going to bump, we're going to hit roads. We're going to have, I just got done right before I went live with you. Um, I was thinking about some feedback that that I gave within a community, my own community, but they asked for feedback, right? It's one of those, like, I'm asking for feedback. How am I doing? Which I, that's, those are the people you want to find people that are like, I'm in community with you. Would you tell me how I'm doing? But, and I delivered my honest feedback in love and overall, it's just funny how we focus on what's wrong more than all the things that are right. But I, I'm sitting there praying for this person going, I hope they receive that well. Like it, it's just in the, that's vulnerable. She took the vulnerability of asking for the feedback. I took the risk of, oh, if I tell her, she might be mad. This is real life stuff. This is where life happens. Not Social media is not going to do that for me. And even if they did, I can always go, oh, they don't know me, right? It, it's like, it's so, 100%. it's so fake. It's fake, exactly. Fake nutrients, fake food. Oh my goodness. Okay. Chris, <laughs> let me I have two more questions for you. What do you think? Not, I know you're like, we're just talking brother, sister in Christ. 
what do you think the future of social media is? What do you, when you look at it and it, it just, what do you sense is going to happen? And perhaps what are we to do as the future rolls out? Yeah. Uh, the future is definitely going to be a more, uh, online existence. Um, there's a lot of talk these days about like web three and the metaverse, which are both realities that, uh, I think are unavoidable and that we should, we should prepare for. Ah, the meta. Um, Will you explain meta to people? I May mean, explain it to me even. Yeah. Okay, I've, so, I've tasted a little bit. I'm like, maybe I just don't want to know more, but I need to know. So tell yeah. me. So, okay. So the metaverse, generally speaking, is an online community and form of existence that transcends platforms. It was it was coined in a book called Snow Crash written in 1992 by Neil Stevenson. It's a novel. Wow. It's a wow. very, very, dy very dystopian, dystopian novel, yeah. kind of like 1984, like 1984 or Brave New World, like that kind of vibe. Um, and I'm actually in the middle of reading it right now because I heard that, A, I heard it was pretty good and B, this is where the term comes from. So I was like, okay. I should probably read this book. Um, and so it's it's like, imagine this. Like we're on a Zoom call right now. Right. Some people might use Microsoft Teams for work or, right. uh, and then they, or maybe their kids play video games at night, log on to Fortnite or some other video game. Right. Um, imagine a world in which instead of meeting via Zoom, uh, we have VR headsets on and we're meeting in a sort of like virtual space where it's kind of like a Zoom room, but instead of me looking at a webcam and then you being on my screen, I'm looking into these goggles and I'm not, I'm just looking at a virtual version of you, right? Um, yeah. So we're in, we're, I imagine a pretty near future, maybe a decade or, or 15 years where instead of being in Zoom meetings all day, folks who work in office environments, they're in Ooh. like, virtual conference rooms yep. and Goodness. um perhaps in that in that environment you can purchase like some really cool shoes for your avatar let's say like okay. you, you got some sweet you got some sweet jordans for your okay. avatar <laughs> that you bought for 80 bucks in the microsoft metaverse so you could wear them to your next like work function and people could be all impressed right do i actually then, get the shoes in real life no 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 no, no I, just in the virtual i want them uh, in real life what am i okay sure. Sure. But they're hard to find supply chain issues, right? <laughs> oh, that's so, true. Um, in the metaverse, there's you get whatever you want as and, you and want. And frankly, it. like I joke, I oh, joke weird. kind of there, but, but I think, I think compounding issues like that may make digital goods more, more valuable and interesting because there's oh, no limit man. to that. So anyway, so you buy an $80 pair of s sweet Jordans for your metaverse Microsoft meetings, but then in the evening, you're going to go to some social function in a different, in a different online existence. And you can actually, your little avatar person can take those same shoes you bought in your work metaverse and wear them to that social function and the other, what it like the digital mm -hmm. assets is what they're called transfer across platforms. So it's not okay. like, Oh, you bought something there. Well, you can't use it over here. Okay. It should, it should transfer okay. across. We're getting quite technical. I um, like it. So Keep going. There, are, there are all kinds of companies that are trying to do this. Microsoft, Facebook wow. slash Meta, um, yeah. Google's doing their own version. Everybody's doing their own version. And the hope is they would play together because if they don't play together, then it's just, it's just virtual reality. Like it's not mm. virtual reality and the, and the metaverse are different things. Mm -hmm. um, virtual reality is a component of the metaverse, mm -hmm. but a, a metaverse means like you all of anywhere. these different companies and their, their own little universes yes. are actually connected. Talking, right? talking. And mm -hmm. this is where, this is where cryptocurrency comes in. Like you, you, like it's money that translates across all of these things. Right. Um, so anyway, without getting too much more technical, I think that is where we're headed. Like, I don't, I don't think we stop, like, that's not gonna, that is going to happen. I think how we prepare for it is by not freaking out. Um, I don't like, I don't think in your lifetime or mine, people are going to live primarily in the metaverse. Like, I think a lot of people are freaking out because they have this idea that we're going to go from none of us really owning VR headsets at all. Like a very small portion of the population owns the VR headset to in five years, all of us are just going to be like those characters in uh, Wally -E who are like sitting in yeah. their spaceship, just sitting in a chair in a VR yeah. headset all day. Yeah. I, d I don't think we go there that fast. Okay. Um, but I do think that like, like when I joined my company, they sent me a laptop, right? They sent me right. a work laptop. That's a right. very normal thing. I would envision in 15 VR. years, they're going to send me a headset along with that, with that thing. Because if you think about it, like if you really think about it, 
is meeting via a VR experience that much more ridiculous than meeting no. via a, a webcam experience? Like it's not I that actually kind of, I actually go, that would be pretty cool to be able to be in a sense more with my team. Cause we have a very virtual team at Revelation Wellness. Right. And like, I could see us going, well, let's give it a try. Yeah. And, and I think that will happen. That it will probably happen in the workspace before it happens a whole lot yeah. elsewhere, but then there'll, there'll be killer apps as they're called, you know, some game that everybody wants to be playing or whatever else. And these things will start to happen. But I, I think we need to not freak out because I don't think, I think we aren't going to end up spending 90% of our time in this space for a while. I do think that could happen, but that's, I think beyond your lifetime and mine. You think that's in your um, daughter's lifetime? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Mm. And but here's the other thing. And everybody, again, everybody has different perspectives on this kind of stuff. So I don't want to step on people's toes, but if you, if, if you, don't think climate change changes a hoax. Like if you start to see like more climate issues or whatever else, people may people may end up needing to be inside more if we have another pandemic in the next 50 to mm -hmm. 70 years. Like a VR experience and staying in your house starts to become a little bit more of a necessity. I think the supply chain thing that I mentioned where where physical goods are much more scarce, that makes that makes digital goods more appealing to people. So I think there are a confluence of factors that could drive us to be want be wanting or needing to have a more screen mediated existence yeah. than we want than we want. Yeah. Um, but that's a whole, you know, that here's one thing I am optimistic about for the future, if I can mention this. Please. Um, you know, I feel bad for my parents because my parents are brilliant. They parented me very well. They were great parents in every sense of the word. My dad worked at IBM most of my young life from home, actually. And so I was on the computer when I was like five in 1995, wow. I was hanging yeah. out on, on a windows 95 computer. Yeah. Um, but even they, as great of parents as they were, had no idea how to parent 15 year old Chris in 2005, logging onto MySpace after school mm -hmm. and carrying my cell phone around. Like they just yeah. had no, had no way to know how to parent me then in, in that yeah. environment. Yeah. And I think a lot of parents, you know, parents of teenagers now, or even parents of teenagers like five years ago when smartphones were just exploding everywhere, yep. Yep. they were learning how to parent kids with smartphones. Because even yeah, I, like, the iPhone came out when I was a junior in high school, but most high schoolers were not carrying around smartphones when I was in high school. So, yeah. you know, when in the 2010s, yeah. parents were having to learn how to parent kids with smartphones. My hope is, this is where I'm really optimistic. My hope is that kids who are teenagers today, 16, 17, 18 year olds, when they're having kids, when they're having kids in 15 to 18 years, whatever, you know, when they're 30, when they're 35 and they, they're having kids of their own and their kids are getting close to maybe being teenagers, that they have a much more sober understanding of what social point. media can do to a teenager. Because parents today, like even my peers who have, like I work in the student ministry at our church, and the, the parents of the students in our student ministry, I feel bad for them. Like they, they are on the, ed, like they are some of, among the first parents to ever have to try to figure out how to parent Total. a kid who carry, carries Absolutely. a stage in their pocket all the time. Oh. And my, yeah. I'm trying, like my daughter's only two. And I know in about 10 years, I'm going to have to be answering questions. Like, why can't I have a, whatever the platform is. At whatever that time. It is. And, and I'm trying to learn right now from these parents, but I know a little bit about what it's like to be a teenager with social media. And my hope is that even the kids who are today, like perhaps you're listening and you have a teenager, my hope is that if you feel a little ill-equipped to parent a teenager with social media, um, that your child who's currently a teenager may feel a little bit more equipped than you, though, though social media will change and obviously technology will change just as we described they'll have a little bit better of an understanding because they learned what it was like to be 17 with an Instagram and parents today had have no idea what that was like in large part. And so my hope is just that the parent child social media relationship triangle that happens may be a little bit healthier in the, in the future, but we'll see. That is so good. When we a bell when I this remember that everyone that is a great way to leave on an optimist spot. and it puts Jesus back on the throne. He is not surprised by the time that we live in. He chooses the places and the times for us to live. That is a really good insight of you, right? My parents didn't know how to parent me 
I didn't know how to parent uh, my my child as they're learning at that stage, but our kids now, they know it. They, And even now my daughter is 18 years old and kind of went through the fire of high school with the internet and social media and Snapchat and all the things. And now she's got, I have friends who have younger daughters and she's like, oh gosh, no, don't let them have that. Or no, no you know, she has, she yep. knows the perils that I didn't have to deal with in 1989, just totally dated myself going through high school. So that is yep. a really good way to be like, Hey, we have authority over this. The Lord has timing for everything. Um, we don't have to be afraid. There's some fascinating things that will come with the technology. Uh, and it also takes me into this weird um, quantum physics world of like, what really is real, right? Like if you think about the kingdom and like the unseen world and what, what, like, we make it so much about this stuff, this touched matter where I'm like, oh, this is interesting. What could the Lord be doing in this space virtual existence? I don't know. I'm sure we'll get yeah. some people going, what are you doing? What are you doing? Um, yeah, I, I love it. I'm so excited. This is a great conversation. You guys, Terms of Service is the book by Chris Martin, The Real Cost of Social Media. It's a great book. I have read quite a few books when it comes to the social media realm and our smartphones, technology, but it's a great read. It is one that you can, like, neighbor could read and anyone and not feel like they're getting preached at in any way. It's just sound truth and good, a good hearted message. Um, okay, quick three questions I ask every guest before we go. Ready, Chris? Yes. Coffee, tea, or kombucha? What's your go-to? Coffee. How many cups a day? Too many. <laughs> I like always actually, cry. I, I feel I feel really I I feel really self-conscious answering this to a wellness expert. Um, actual like six ounce cups, because I think that's how they're measured technically. Uh, technically. Probably probably like four. Five. Okay, that's not bad. I was bracing for like six to eight. I've known people that literally IV drip it in mainline. Yeah. Yeah. Four <laughs> or five in the morning, but then sometimes afternoon may take it over, over. Might the go over. All right. Well, Hey, as a, what, you know, there's also research telling how good it is for your brain and some other stuff. So I'm not here to judge, um, your favorite way to move your body. Oh man. Oh gosh. Um, I love playing ultimate frisbee i don't get to do it nearly as much today as i used to like in college and stuff but it is it is my favorite that's fun. thing to do um but at the gym like i go to the gym over lunch every day uh yeah. and i'm usually doing various weights and then either like the cross trainer elliptical vibe or, yes. or the stationary bike so there you go. at the gym these days that's usually what i do and then what is your apparel workout wear brand where you shop or your so wife like, shops for you. <laughs> so, so I'm built like an offensive lineman. I mean, I was one in high school. So oh, like, yeah. I'm, I'm like six, four, 250, 260. Okay. I have a wide, a foot wider than anyone wow. else I know. So I don't get a whole lot of choice. No, uh, that's true. Very, Where do you nor, go then? Nor am I very fashion conscious. <laughs> so I'm usually rocking some like Saucony shoes. Okay. Uh, and it's funny. Sometimes I laugh. I'll have like, I'll have like, champion compression shorts on Nike go. shorts on yeah. Reebok socks on <laughs> and then you know and then like an Adidas shirt or something like that so I'm, oh, I'm it's a cornucopia of goodness yeah, I, if anybody's looking to to advert to uh sponsor me like I'll take a one brand vibe you know whatever I'll work to my <laughs> local gym <laughs> I love it all right, Chris, thank you for being here. You guys, you can go to Amazon, all the places that you can find books. Um, you can follow Chris. I'm going to follow him today on Twitter at Chris Martin 17, right? At Chris Martin 17. And I think you're a thought leader. I really do. I think in, for, in terms of this, this area, I'm listening. Keep me informed on the metaverse and keep reminding me not to freak out. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It was really fun to chat. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for watching, and remember, this video was brought to you by Revelation Wellness Instructor Training Program. Do you love Jesus and have a passion for fitness and wellness? Or maybe you're tired of the roller coaster of obsessing over and neglecting your body, and you know there has to be more to fitness. Let us equip you to lead others to health and wholeness rooted in Jesus Christ through our faith-based fitness instructor training program. Go to our website to learn more and listen to testimonies of people just like you who are bringing hope and healing to their communities as fitness teacher gospel preachers. 
Click the link in the description of this video and download a packet to get your journey to health and wholeness through Christ started today.